everyone for making time to join us. It's a real pleasure to have everyone uh, be part of this session. Uh, and we are also very grateful to the speakers who've made time to contribute to this uh, session, the lessons learned from first responders to the COVID crisis across the continent. We uh, are coming through uh, a really devastating time for the continent. And I think uh, some of the efforts that the speakers uh, today put in, in trying to address the challenges that society was facing uh, would go a long way in hoping in helping a lot of us uh, get better and understand not only how to deal with what are still the remnants of the crisis, but also future uh, such pandemics should they hit us again. Uh, we're, we're really glad to partner with uh, Intellecup and Sankalp, uh, Sankalp in this particular session. We had a long running uh, engagement through the COVID crisis, uh, planning and running about 10 webinars, which culminated in a white paper that Ariel I'm sure will speak to uh, later in the session. Uh, but for now, as AVPA, we're really glad that you could be able to join us. For those who don't know AVPA, we are a network of social investors who are looking to collaborate to address especially Africa's financing challenges towards uh, meeting our SDG targets. And uh, we've got um, some exciting stuff coming up, so please visit our website when you can. But uh, to everyone, thank you for making time. Ariel, over to you. Uh, or the moderator, do you want to pick it up from here? Yes, yes, certainly. Yes, okay. um, I'm just going to make a couple of housekeeping announcements before we start. So the first one is that uh, to ask all attend I'm just asking all attendees and guests to keep their microphones and their videos off. Um, but for the panelists, we kindly ask that you keep your videos on, but your microphones on mute unless you are speaking. Um, the other thing is that the session should be about an hour with 20 minutes at the very end for questions and answers. Um, and we are kindly requesting if you have any questions, upload them to the to the chat um, and the panelists will answer them. Um, if you're able to kindly direct them to a specific panelist that you'd like to answer the question and then the panelists kindly keep an eye on the chats and answer any that are directed to you. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I'd like to just introduce the people who are participating today. We have an amazing group of people. I'm so honored to be moderating this panel. These are all people who are doing prolific things across the continent. Um, I'm going to start with Andrea Benson, who is the director of CASLI, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Mathematics Education. Uh, and then we have Melissa Menke, who is the founder. I hope I said it right. Melissa, you can... Don't, you can send me hate mail after. <laughs> uh, Melissa is the founder and CEO of Access Afia. And then we have Samir. Samir is a CEO and co-founder of Sun Culture and he leads the Shikilia project. Then we have Megan. Megan is the West Africa director at Acumen. And finally, we have James Mongi, um, who is the ex-director of Dalberg and one of the founding members of Safe Hands. So welcome all of you panelists and we look forward to having you all. I'm going to jump right into the question and answers, uh, well, to the questions and ask specific questions to each of you. And then when you have a question, you can speak a little bit about your initiative and what are the interventions that you put in place specifically for the COVID um, pandemic and how you've responded as a leader and as an organization. And the first question will go to Megan and Samir. Um, Megan, as I mentioned, is the West Africa Director for Acumen. Um, Acumen is a social impact enterprise, and Megan, you can speak a little more about that. And more often to achieve skill. Can you hear me? I lost you for just a second. Could you just repeat the second half of the question? Sorry about that. Okay, I think she may have been asking about um, partnerships and collaboration during COVID that enabled us to achieve scale. Um, so I'll jump in in anticipation of that based on our prep. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. And I have to say, 
Um, I'm a bit humbled to be on a panel titled First Responders. Acumen really enables the work of so many organizations that um, were more on the front lines of COVID response, but tried to play our part as investors and as partners to the organizations that we work with. Um, and so just briefly, Acumen led two relief initiatives um, within its work in West Africa in response to COVID-19. The first was part of a global facility that we raised um, where we issued grants and uh, essentially zero interest loans to both our portfolio companies, the companies we invest in, as well as um, individuals that run social enterprises and nonprofits within our fellows community. We run a, a leadership development program called the West Africa Fellows Program. The second and where the collaboration conversation becomes more interesting is that we also recognize that not only companies that we already were invested in had a need during this time, but also companies that were in our pipeline that were earlier stage, but that we hope to invest in down the line. And recognizing that impact investors in West Africa often cite a lack of quality pipeline or deal flow um, as a constraint to investing. We wanted to ensure that those early stage companies didn't drop into the abyss of, of COVID essentially. And so we were able to partner with two other Nigeria-based investors and pool our funds together to issue a series of grants to very early stage um, social enterprises. These are businesses that are much earlier stage than what Acumen would typically invest in. Um, and yet it enabled us to unlock what is traditionally sort of non-impact capital or more mainstream capital um, and to be able to support more companies than if Acumen had gone in alone or, you know, um, Acumen had just done a handful of these. And so that was for us a great example and kind of, I don't know, I think in the investing space you can lean toward competition and COVID was a great motivator to lean further into collaboration. Um, and share, you know, pool funds, share decision making, and identify a number of companies that we wanted to support in that way. And hopefully, you know, gives us an example of, of other ways that we can collaborate across investors um, in the longer term. So I'll pause there and hand it to Samir. Yes, Samir will, will answer that question as well. Do you need me to repeat it for you, Samir? Please. Okay, so the question is, how can we use lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic to sensitize stakeholders on the need to collaborate more strategically and more often to achieve skill? And you can talk a little bit about some of the collaborations that- So, um, as, yeah, so I, um, I'll talk about Shikilia, which was the sort of collaboration that came out of COVID-19. So Shikilia is a collaboration of the public and private sector that exists to deliver direct cash transfers to people who were affected by COVID-19. And for those of you who don't know what direct cash transfers are, they're exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we're sending monthly cash um, directly to people who were the most vulnerable during the pandemic. Um, direct cash transfers have been proven around the world to be a really important tool for alleviating um, political and economic stress, but also to help um, create more food secure communities in times like this. Um, it's been used in 150 plus countries around the world as a COVID response. Um, and there's a lot of NGOs, specifically an NGO like Give Directly in Kenya, who have been running very long programs to show the direct benefits of this. So it's an amazing tool when you look at creating social equity and especially on creating social safety nets in, in situations like this. Um, when, when COVID started, one of the, I think, most important parts of what we were doing and what um, Safe Hands was doing and, and, and everyone on this call is getting people together who may not have often worked together. Um, so we call ourselves a coalition because we had people from um, the, the private sector, we had people from NGOs, we had donors, we had bankers, we had people in the government, everyone came together to sit around a table and say, how do we do anything that we can to solve this problem? We identified direct cash transfers as one of the key pillars that needed to happen to ensure that there wasn't political, economic, food unrest um, in 
by unrest means people going hungry and dying. Um, and what started off as us trying everything very quickly ended up being that we were focused on lobbying and advocacy. Um, so I, I think one of the key, I suppose, takeaways from this exercise for, for me is that collaboration needs to happen, but it needs to happen before a pandemic hits or before a crisis. Um, the group of people that came together for this, you know, we're sticking together. We're, we're continuously trying to work together to make sure that this type of coalition continues moving forward. But one of my takeaways is that, you know, it did take time to get the coalition together. But if we already have coalitions and partnerships in place pre-pandemic, if we have frameworks in place and roles and responsibilities like any organization of who does what when a crisis hits, we're able to move a bit faster. Um, so I think that was one of the one of the key takeaways that that I came out with. Um, the, the coalition did did well. Um, I think we we were you know part of a group of folks that were helping share data with the government to move away from direct food delivery to direct cash transfers. We were part of a larger group that helped um, get some county level um, folks and some and some large corporates look at cash transfers. Um, there was a lot of work being done by a lot of people to do this. A number of our implementers raise tens of millions of dollars. They're directly sending money to people's MPESA accounts right now. So I, I would say overall, this partnership approach works um, because everyone drops their egos, right? And if you if you look at something like a coalition, like a partnership, everyone drops their egos, what we work towards, uh, it does create some magic. Um, so I, I would say that uh, very pro this approach. And the key to this was, was like I said, everyone just dropped. Okay, thank you, Samir. Um, and I think that uh, you kind of led us to the next question, which is on government collaboration. So I'm going to ask you to take that as well. Um, so I'm going to direct this question to you and to Melissa. Melissa is the CEO of Access Afia. Um, just could you talk a little bit about government collaboration and what that looked like? Um, what are the what was the value of this? So not for the learnings you had from this period, particularly in relating to government, um, and how this could be improved. How, what are kind of the pitfalls that you had and how, could, how did you navigate those? Uh, very briefly in about a minute and a half. I know that's like a thesis question, but sure. <laughs> if you could do it. No, 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 it's <laughs> fine. I think, I, sure, I think that what I've learned is that um, solutions, at least during this pandemic in, in Kenya, solutions to a lot of problems were solved in a very decentralized, very on the ground way resources are being allocated in a very centralized government way. Those two things didn't match up. Solutions were being formed much faster than resources were being allocated. And there was a mm. huge gap in mm. getting decision makers who had the resources to look at what to allocate for versus all of the solutions that were being created. And I think that was one, because of decision fatigue around what solutions to fund. I think two, there was a mismatch and there was no, there were, there were not a lot of bridges between government and the solutions. James is a really good example of a bridge, but there weren't enough bridges for what was happening at resource allocation and solutions happening. So what we did was we just needed people in our organizing committee who had relations with governments, but it was the, the decisions were just not happening fast enough. So I think there needs to be, like I said, a pre-existing framework, a pre-existing partnership, a pre-existing pre de decision manual for how to make sure that resources are being allocated quickly because it's the centralized versus decentralized conundrum that the speed wasn't matching up for both of those. Mm. Yeah, um, thank you, Samir. Those are some fantastic insights. Um, I'm going to direct the same question to Melissa because Melissa, you're in health and I'm, I'm guessing you had to do quite a bit of work with both county and central government in health. How, how did you navigate those, that relationship, particularly with government? What are some of the pitfalls as well? Could you speak a little bit about government relations um, and how to navigate those and what learnings you had? Yeah, so just for context, uh, Access Afia is the company I run and we're a chain of, of 15 primary healthcare clinics operating in four different counties. So even more sub counties. Um, so we do work a lot with government. Um, we're seeing around 10,000 patients every month and our, Initial roles in, in a pandemic are a get good information training and screening protocol in place so that you can actually responsibly escalate suspected COVID-19 patients and then be maintain other essential health services so people don't forego uh, diabetes care, mm -hmm. antenatal care and whatnot, um, which, which I could speak to more at some point. 
I think specifically with government, I mean, I, I definitely agree there, there is in the resource gap or the gap between resources and, and innovation that, that Samir said, I think that some of the things that were immediate wins for us um, is when it came to things like advocacy and training, then the decentralized government structure worked really well. We were able to partner with, with government to help train community health workers on COVID-19 symptoms. We were able to, to kind of work on various programs that involved getting our providers online training. We put a bunch of training on an online academy and shared that with, with partners, um, you know, sort of public and private. So, so when, when we kind of think about, um, you know, advocacy, education, training, Th that sort of coordination was happening relatively seamlessly. What's, what's really hard for us is healthcare is incredibly operational. And so we don't just sort of engage with, with uh, government or any of our partners in a purely sort of advocacy way. We, we actually have to operationally connect with um, county hospitals. And, and this was incredibly difficult, I, I think in, in a number of ways because you have a lot of work going into writing protocol you know, what do you do when a patient is in respiratory distress? What do you do with suspected cases? What do you do, you know, in, in these situations? Um, and yet the counties were, were overwhelmed. And I think that that is a bigger question for, for all of us, you know, government and non-governmental partners. Um, I think that we could do a better job of, of modeling how we allocate resources so that county hospitals were not actually as overwhelmed. Um, as, as they were. So, so I think one of our biggest challenges was in the actual sort of operational escalation of, of patients. I think our worst case was it took 24 hours to get somebody out of one of our clinics and into a hospital who needed care. Mm. I think best case is closer to six. And this is stuff that should be happening in, you know, 30 minutes um, so people can get tested and, and get on ventilators if they need to. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Melissa. I mean, some of the things you speak to were actually you know, flaws within the healthcare system that existed before COVID, but have been magnified by this pandemic. So these were, were problems, that, you know, there were, there were cracks that, that already existed, but have just been made much bigger. And I guess that kind of brings us to the next question is how do we pivot um, or change strategy in the working of an organization to meet these challenges? So there's kind of a way we were operating, um, there's kind of a way we were doing things, but now that has to change because we are dealing with something of a much bigger magnitude and a much bigger scale. So how do we change how our organizations function and work? And I'm going to direct the question right back at you, Melissa, again. What are some of the things you've had to change in how your organization runs, you know, aside from, uh, you know, gov government and all the other relation, other, other players, in the sector, yourselves as an organization, what are some of the things you definitely had to change to, to meet this? Um, so I'm gonna ask that question to you and to Megan. Uh, Megan will speak a little bit about what they did as the Acumen Fund in West Africa, but I'd, I'd like you to, to give your opinion as well with Access Africa and how you had to pivot. Yeah, so I think one thing that, that we did and a lot of health providers did is you move more of your care to the digital realm. Uh, because, you know, people are, you know, initially, you know, with the dawn to dusk or a dusk to dawn curfew, people couldn't always physically access the care they needed, but, but also just to, to work to help people stay home um, in an effort to flatten the curve, people need to be able to access services. And this is incredibly long overdue. I think there's a lot of good um, comparatives from, from telehealth in other markets. There's uh, pretty strong protocols that, that have proven that you can do about at least 40% of, of care um, without actually being face-to-face -face with the doctor. We've been really slow to take this up because our market is informal settlements and a lot of people don't necessarily have smartphones, don't necessarily want to use their data on apps. And so we focused a lot on, you know, SMS with in-clinic experience being the primary interaction. And that has, has really completely shifted. So, so we've moved all of our coaching programs um, online. We're using you know, we, we, we built a, a digital health app that helps people connect um, called MDoctari, but we're also using WhatsApp. We're also using kind of callbacks and, and different strategies to actually be able to do that. And, and that's actually been really effective. I think the first thing that, that we've learned is that over a third of our patients will actually just engage with us on a, on a smartphone, even if it's a simple one, um, even in the informal settlements. And, and then also, you know, from some of these other strategies I talked about, we've been able to get engagement in, in some of the other 
groups as well. So, um, th so that's, I think, a huge shift. And I think, you know, again, to kind of bring it a little bit back to government, that was another incredibly useful thing we saw is the government has now created a licensing process for virtual clinics. Um, which has never existed. So telemedicine was always in a gray area. You were always sort of writing an MOU with, with, with a ministry, um, not sure if it's PPB or, or MOH all the time. And this made it crystal clear exactly how, how to be licensed. And I, I guess my last silver lining on that is, is because you completely remove the ability to tie licensing to the size of your waiting room or kind of all of these things that don't necessarily correlate to patient outcomes but but are on a licensing procedure we found the virtual clinic licensing process to be much much more focused on how are you going to deliver quality care what's your protocols who are your people and i think that's a good thing overall for for the health sector okay thank you thank you melissa uh, megan could you take that question and just tell us how you pivoted to to meet the challenges that were presented by covid yeah, thanks. And I think for us, it was more a pivot of um, how we operationalize more than strategy itself. Although the one obvious pivot was pivoting to issuing grants. You know, traditionally, Acumen's bread and butter is making early stage equity investments. So, you know, post COVID, we'll go back to doing just equity. But what we learned in terms of the process of how quickly we could move and how quickly COVID forced us to move. Um, there are lessons in there that we'll take forward to our regular investing. So in this instance, it was a two page application um, for the fellows organizations and companies. We asked them to submit their prior year financials and a previous grant application if they were nonprofits just to have more of the business plan laid out that way or an existing business plan that they had pre-COVID if they were an enterprise and really with very light documentation and a pretty swift approval process. There was some iterating on articulating the needs, setting the budget for the grant, um, but keeping that as light and swift as possible. And similarly with the impact you know, reporting requirements that we set, we said just a, a six month report at the end and then one a year out um, to really kind of break some of the traditional, um, I guess, red tape or bureaucracy, either for organizations trying to get grants in normal times or um, trying to get investment. And we were raising funds in April and May. By mid-May, we had started to deploy. Um, and from when we got an application to when we were issuing checks was somewhere between a, a two and three week period um, for most of the applicants. And so Again, we can't go down to a two page application for equity investments. It's always gonna be a little bit more robust than that. But I do think we learned and spotted opportunities where we could simplify our diligence process a little bit, simplify some of our documentation and hopefully move, um, you know, not as quickly as we did during COVID but not as slowly as we've been moving before um, to be able to be responsive to company needs. Um, thank you so much, Megan. That definitely, um, you know, summarizes just that operationally, that was one of the ways you had to make a change. Uh, Melissa brought up something about tech and digital, and that kind of brings me to the next question about the use of tech and digital for interventions, and particularly um, using tech in a way that doesn't enforce disparities, but rather minimizes disparities. And this question would be directed to um, Enri and James, because their interventions were quite tech heavy. Um, James was the founder, CEO of Safe Hands, and they used a lot of uh, geospatial monitoring and so on and so forth for their interventions. James, could you speak a little bit about tech and, in and digital for interventions and particularly how the angle of minimizing disparities came into it? Um, because there's always a problem of using tech and leaving out the people who have no access to tech, but how can tech be used um, to minimize this and Tell, yeah, to just tell us a little bit about that in two minutes or so. Uh, thank you, uh, Njiro. Um, uh, so firstly, it's a privilege to be part of this discussion. Um, also, by way of minor uh, clarification, I'm, you know, uh, I, I chaired the Safe Hands Coalition. We did have uh, our CEO, uh, Andrew Waititu. Oh, okay. Andrew Waititu, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the clarification, yes. Uh, but I was part of the, 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 the coalition of CEOs that got together or, or business leaders that got together to basically 
uh, try and figure out what could be done quickly uh, to structure a response. And I think uh, with regard to technology, I think there were a couple of aspects here. Uh, the first was, as you've said before, you know, what Safe Hands tried to do was make sure that some of the basic things we could do uh, to protect people. So increasing access to hand washing and subsequently to masks and drive behavior change to make sure those things are happening as fast as possible and to use the existing capabilities and networks of, uh, of, 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 of businesses operating, particularly in the informal areas of, uh, of Nairobi. And what we found was, uh, was a couple of things. The first was, and it's something that Samir was saying, which is a lot of the speedy solutions were bubbling up from the grassroots and how do you integrate and organize them? So for example, you had this mandate that uh, uh, was a central mandate and I think that was laudable to say we needed to have hand washing stations at every, uh, at every shop. Uh, but then how do you set up those things? How do you make sure that each shopkeeper at a moment of real distress is able to both create, you know, uh, provide a hand washing station and stock it? Uh, and then secondly, how do you make sure that people who are not happening to pass by a retail location do have access to uh, hand washing? And for that, there were two kinds of technology or, or, or technology driven solutions that came into play. The first was traditionally or historically the bulk of retail uh, for, for the mass market in Kenya and in most African countries is informal. It would take a while to really figure out who's doing what where. But over the last few years, we've had a number of technology enabled startups who actually do have as part of their core business model um, relationships with thousands, tens of thousands uh, of, uh, of, of smaller retailers uh, whom they have geospatially mapped uh, and whom they're in regular contact with. And so one of the quickest things that we were able to do was actually just distribute soap and help with the creation of, uh, of the smaller hand washing stations uh, at the shops that needed it and do that in the, you know, to the order of thousands of, of, of these. Um, but importantly, also track where this was happening because we suddenly had uh, real reliable geospatial data on where each of these locations was. And what that allowed us to do that we couldn't have been able to do earlier is actually identify blind spots, spaces where people were far away from hand washing stations or where the volume of, of foot traffic in, uh, at any given time exceeded the capacity of the hand washing stations near the stores or, or near homes. And what we were then able to do is with, you know, uh, arguably near pinpoint accuracy, say here are the spots where if you put uh, additional hand washing stations, you'll get the greatest amount of usage. Subsequently, um, we are then able to use some of the observed data from that to say, where is it if we're going to distribute masks or if we're going to try and drive behavior change through posters and so on, where is it that we're seeing the right level of foot traffic and the right level of exposure? And so what technology was doing, the, the, the actual things that were being delivered were about as low tech as you can get, right? Soap, water, masks. You know, there's nothing digital about those things. Um, there was a digital component to driving behavior change, which was uh, digital messaging uh, and advertising, et cetera. But ultimately the real value of technology was in the flow of data and in the ability to pinpoint where you focused uh, and where you deployed resources. And that allowed for greater efficiency and greater speed uh, and also faster pivoting when we realized that, you know, everyone already had soap in a neighborhood. Let's stop dropping off soap there. Let's switch to some of the other interventions. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, you raise an interesting point about leveraging existing, existing data. And I think one of the questions that Nancy had shared earlier was, how can we use the capital that already exists within the African um, continent and, you know, Part of the thing is that it, we have gone through an explosion of data and tech-based tech -based companies. So collaborating with them and using the data that already exists. Um, thank you for raising that. I'd like to direct the question to Enric. Um, Enric, please tell us a little bit about using digital and tech in your area, which is education, and particularly what that experience was like in South Africa um, and, and how that kind of evolved and what learnings you have from it, what insights are very um, unique that you felt before COVID you had not, you had no experience of the same. Henry, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I think it echoes a lot, some, to some extent what James is saying about low tech solutions. So early in the, um, early in the lockdown, our hard lockdown, 
we uh, there was this like floodgate of online digital education resources. So we have 12 million children in the system, and um, our instinct as a, a nonprofit working in education was that many of the children weren't actually accessing these resources. So we did some rapid research, and the um, the evidence from that pointed to that reality is that actually there was this massive divide with uh, very few learners in rural and informal community, informal settlements and in peri-urban communities actually accessing online. And a number of reasons for that was data, connectivity, um, access to devices, and these kinds of things. So um, on the back of that, we were able to pivot and say, well, how do we respond? And actually we went for low tech solutions. So really sort of light, data light solutions, focusing on messaging um, and also paper-based resources. Uh, through a distribution network with other NGOs and nonprofits working in the space, able to collaborate, share um, the development of paper-based resourcing for learning at home. Um, and that was kind of the, the real, I think the way we sort of pivoted in terms of uh, reaching out to children who weren't able to access this floodgate of online uh, resources. The other thing I think that's important is to say the, the, the learning is that so over, as we as we progressed um, through the, the next couple of months, um, we were fortunate in that in South Africa we do have quite a strong coalition approach um, to the work that happens in education. So, for example, we have a legislative framework called the Education Collaboration Framework, and um, spinning out of that is something called the National Education Collaboration Trust, which really sort of brings together the players, private, government, and civil society partners who work in education. And then also there is a, um, a member-based association of nonprofits, social enterprises, and social change organizations working in education called NASCI. So we already had some of the workings of the framework for coalition and for collaboration. And so um, that was really important for us to be able to um, connect fairly quickly and fairly um, uh, rapidly to be able to respond. And one of the things that came out of that work for example, was a real push towards the public broadcaster. Um, and uh, over a, a fairly, fairly quick turnaround, a platform was launched uh, called Wars Matrix, which focused on our grade 12, so the inline um, learners in the system to be able to access free to air public broadcast education, as well as through radio. Um, so there was a lot of sort of, um, yeah, so I think that was really important. And the way, and the only way that was able to work was through these, these collaboration structures that were already in place. Um, so yeah, I think those are sort of the, the, the important things. The other thing that was really important that um, I think the lesson for us was that through um, what emerged fairly quickly um, was something called the uh, COVID-19 Education Coalition, which was a sort of a more informal gathering of um, organizations. And emerging from that was a fair amount of um, pressure put on government to, for example, regularize the zero rating of education and nonprofit websites. So um, in a fairly quick turnaround, we were able to establish a process which involved the Department of Education, Department of Communications. And um, so we saw in a very short space of time, thousands of nonprofit and education organizations, websites and resources being zero rated. So um, eliminating this issue of, of data charges. And then there was also the innovative use of messaging around, for example, chargebacks. So we do have a zero rated messaging platform because that's the one problem, of course, with messaging is that it's not zero rated, difficult to zero rate. Um, but there is um, uh, one particular platform that is um, possible to do that uh, called Moyo Messenger, which, was, uh, which has been in place for a while, um, but it really sort of came into its own during this period of time. Yeah, so I think those are the sort of key takeaways for me is that one, we had to really sort of listen to people on the ground and say, what's your reality? Are we responding to your reality? Or are we responding to something that's pie in the sky? And then of course, uh, leveraging those existing collaboration frameworks. Um, thank you so much, Andy. You've actually partly answered the next question, which was still directed to you, um, which was how do we ensure <laughs> that these alliances last? How do we how do we ensure that they are sustainable? And you've talked very um, succinctly about building collaboration networks. And for you in South Africa, that's a pattern or a framework that you have seen work and worked even more or was even more demonstrable during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I 
think it touches a little bit to what Samir said earlier, is that we had a challenge here in Kenya because we didn't have those frameworks of even how to engage with government and how to collaborate effectively. So you've, you've actually answered the question. I'm going to ask you to add something um, to that, um, yeah. maybe a line or two, um, but right after Meg, because Meg also, uh, I'd like to know, how how do you ensure that these alliances last, especially on a social impact level? And I think why it would be important to hear from Meg is because she's coming from with a West African perspective. So Meg, please go ahead and let us know. And then Andrea, you'll just you know add a line or two to, to kind of close that up. Yeah, thanks. Hello? I mean, I think Meg? that's a great question. And it, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I think that's a great question in terms of how we get these partnerships and strategic alliances to last. Um, I think for us, it was a great opportunity with the two investors that we collaborated with here in Nigeria, just the experience of working together and building that relationship and building that trust where we now have other avenues to, to do other things with them. Um, but I also think COVID helped bring about like the, you know, at least for a time, and I think this is the thing that's hard to hold on to as we move further away from lockdowns and things, but the sense of uh, everyone's interconnected well being and using that as a driving force for um, partnerships and alliances. Um, uh, and, and something that COVID, yeah, really forced upon us. Um, as we go back to versions of normal, you know, how do we not break apart and go back into kind of each swimming in our own lanes and with our own set of priorities? Um, but I really think that, yeah, it, it's kind of a, a soft answer, but I think the trust building and the work that we were able to do in this period and, and as a demonstration to others of what it looks like to pool funding and to share capital and share decision-making um, hopefully you know, inspires and enables more and at a minimum enables us to work closely with these two organizations going forward. Well, thank you. Um, Andrea, maybe a line or two on how we can sustain these partnerships and alliances post, yeah, post the yeah, initial shock and trauma of the pandemic. Yeah, so I think it's really important because that sustainability of the collaboration uh, work is critical. Um, and we've seen such great things coming out of the response um, under COVID-19 that we don't want to lose those. But maybe I'll just pick on one thing. So we've just recently concluded our association conference under the theme of collaborating for change. And one of the focus areas in that was around OER, so in the education space. So open education resources and using a framework that's already in place, the Creative Commons licensing, for example. Um, so where we've tended to see a lot of organizations developing content and distributing it in their own sort of haphazard way, um, OER, um, which is defined by UNESCO, so there is already sort of like really clear um, uh, definitions of what it, what it means to be OER, um, open education resourcing, um, and then with the Creative Commons licensing, because that really has embedded in it um, the idea of uh, sharing um, as well as um, the ability to adapt. Um, and also they use this sort of uh, concept of, of the five R's, so, so reuse, remix, um, and I can't remember all of them off the top of my head now, um, but basically uh, this idea of sort of like developing things for the common good. Um, so I think really sort of just tapping into those kinds of uh, frameworks and um, uh, yeah, that, that I think that's just one example um, of how we can kind of push it beyond, beyond this time. Okay, um, thank you, Henry. Um, I'm, I'm, this is one of hopefully the last question. Uh, I'm going to direct it to Melissa because Melissa has a, the question is about unlikely partnerships. So Melissa runs um, Access Afia and one of the people that they've partnered with is Heineken. And I found that super interesting that Heineken, um, which is a beer company, is partnering with a health company to provide maternal health care. So Melissa, tell us a little bit about unlikely partnerships. How do we build these partnerships? How do you pursue these partnerships? Um, how do you identify the people to, to, to partner with? And that question is also directed to James because Safe Hands was essentially a wash in public health program and some of the partners that they partnered with were accounting firms. Um, there was uh, Deloitte, um, I think there was 
price of the Cooper House. So unlikely partnerships, especially in this space, how do we pursue those? And how do you identify potential for the same? So Melissa and James. So, um, so I think starting with the Heineken, so luckily Heineken has a foundation, the Heineken Africa Foundation, um, um, who, is, who, is, who are officially working with on this project. Uh, but it was really amazing to see how they were able to move quickly to try and address a need that, that came up quickly for us. And that was specifically how the use of essential services like immunizations, antenatal care and family planning were all dropping. And this was coming up from Kenya County level data. It was showing up at our clinic level data. Um, and I think this has also been recently reported also by groups like the Gates Foundation who have looked into this. So we know this was a challenge. Um, and so the way we thought about addressing it was by combining an element of um, vouchers, so essentially like a subsidy, uh, but, but having it really tied into, you know, your next visit. So it really uh, encourages adherence to, to a program. So, so having a voucher cover essentially 30% of the costs of all of the care, which, which wasn't moving to 100% subsidy, but actually was able to kind of mirror what we thought people had lost uh, through, through maybe the the loss of, of a job. So 30% so subsidy across the board, but also we, we introduced um, all of our ANC mothers into telemedicine. We invested more in different types of, we, I mean, we totally rewrote marketing because all of our marketing was face-to-face. -face. So Heineken um, Foundation helped us kind of work through how are we now reaching people um, using radio, using bigger posters, using WhatsApp, using Facebook, and actually kind of getting the, the word out. Um, and then a very cool link with that um, what was where we started to work with Butterfly, who's a digital ultrasound uh, manufacturer based out of the United States, uh, and they make an amazing point of care device that has a teleguidance module, which is incredibly powerful because it means you can have one sonographer doing the interpretation of ultrasounds coming from 15 clinics. So that kind of paired, paired with the Heineken program has actually made our, our ANC program just disruptively low cost, um, but, but also made sure that that we're able to continue to give people the same level of coaching information and whatnot that, that they need on that journey. Thank, yeah. thank you. Uh, from the Safe Hands perspective, actually I think a powerful point to emphasize is Safe Hands was not and is not a WASH coalition. It was a coalition of businesses looking to find ways to apply whatever capabilities they had to address COVID-19. That ended up being about the value chain uh, of uh, making available wash products and also driving behavior change and making masks available. But from the outset, it was a pop-up coalition where the principal question businesses were asking was, uh, look, this crisis is going to hit my business hard. It's gonna hit community harder. And what is it that I can do within the limits of what my organization knows well that is helpful? And if you're Cocoa Networks, you understand the global ethanol markets well, you can say, well, maybe there's something I can do to lower the cost of sanitizer um, to individual consumers. If you're Africa Practice and you're very familiar with, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with public affairs lobbying and, and communications, it's how do we build a, a broader campaign? If you're Pwani, you're saying, I'm in the business of making soap. Um, and frankly, for this duration of time, as long as I can cover the cost of the soap, um, I actually don't need to make a profit on it because actually what I'm trying to do is, is avert the crisis. And so once every business agreed to say, whatever we can do that doesn't, you know, that, that we can do within the limits of our organization is up for grabs. And we all then further agreed to be driven by data and analytics, it then meant that we were very quickly experimenting and pivoting with ways that we could be truly additive. So if something's already being done well by someone else, don't bother doing it. Uh, and so for example, you speak to an accounting firm and you say, well, what we need is a transparent way of tracking and accounting for the resources that we'll receive and proving that uh, the resources received are being applied purely at cost. In other words, that every business has set aside the profit motive for this duration. Are you in a position, Deloitte, to certify that? And they said, well, they were, and they would, they would contribute some time and capacity to doing that. And the Nation Media Group, likewise, saying they would make their, their, their media properties available. But I think the key thing, and I, and I think a, a real insight on what makes for an enduring and robust partnership in a rapidly changing space, 
is not over anchoring in a narrow part of the problem but really finding a broader systemic shared interest and saying we're all working together towards that. And that then allows people to shift and pivot and find the ways that they can be most valuable, or in some cases fade into the background if their capability is not needed. And so at a particular point, Twiga might step forward uh, because of its network of, uh, of relationships with small informal traders. At another point, they may step back because actually what we're now focused on is the, is the large hand washing stations uh, that, that need to be deployed in a slightly different way, and so on and so forth, uh, versus saying, well, our goal and our plan is to deliver this particular product in this particular way, who can help, where, you know, we got started in the middle of March, and by the end of, um, well, late March, and by early May, we had pivoted and adjusted our offering four or five times, just responding to everything we were learning about how the pandemic was evolving. Um, thank you, James. I think you've raised a very important point on flexibility, um, which is one of the themes of, of this discussion of just not just flexible funding, but flexible thinking that um, it's an overall problem that affects different sectors. And so rather than focus or pinpoint on one problem, um, opening it up to more of a, of a systemic thinking, and that also allows for more collaborations and more partnerships. I'm going to open up the session now to questions on, uh, from the from the audience. Um, I cannot see any from the participants. So I'm going to just raise the ones that Nancy has, has uh, typed in the chat box. And this will go to each of the panelists. Maybe all of you can answer. Uh, crisis reveals leadership. So it does, leaders are not made in terms of crisis. They are revealed in terms of crisis. And I, I want to ask, um, a, what would be a personal question to each of you because you've proven to be leaders in each of the fields that you are pursuing. What personal sacrifices have you had to make um, or do you envision having to make in order to adequately build back better? What kind of thinking are you going to direct your organization towards and what kind of ways have you had to pivot personally as a leader in order to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and how, what can our audience learn from it today. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to answer to this. James, I think because you just finished this off, you're going to be the first enough to pick the mantle. So I'll go with James and then we can have Melissa, then Megan, then Andre, then Samir. Great. It's, it's, a, it's a good and, and, and necessarily difficult question. Um, but I think uh, one of the things that I'm reminding myself constantly about in this moment is that we have received, the global system has received a shock that exceeds any that has happened in any of our lifetimes. Uh, if you think about what happens to societies or what happens to business or organizations after such a shock, a whole set of underlying principles that they were built upon turn out no longer to be true. Uh, for any, you know, in Kenya, for example, in 2007, you transacted by handing someone um, cash and them handing you the thing you had bought. By the middle of 2008, the vast majority of Kenyans accepted as a matter of routine that you could move money routinely without being in touch with each other uh, physically. Um, and that was one disruption of three weeks with, uh, with the post-election violence that really drove the adoption of M-Pesa and from which a lot of other things have proceeded in terms of the shape of our, of our digital ecosystem and so on. And so I use, I come back to that because, you know, if you imagine all of the ways that the assumptions on how work operates, on what constitutes value, uh, on what things are important in terms of what we deliver, how many of those things have been proven to either be false or at least 20th century legacy thinking, just from the way that we've had to live over the last nine months. And that means accepting we're not going back to normal after this. This is, we are probably for the most part in a new normal. And that means rethinking everything about how your business or organization works, probably cutting off uh, a range of things that made sense in a previous world, um, but do not anymore. And learning new skills, because a lot of the people on this call are on this call because they had mastered ways of working and being effective and influential in a world that in some ways has passed away. So we need to both recognize and grieve for what was lost. There's a whole set of things we understood and knew that are not coming back, uh, but then shake ourselves off and say, all right, what is true and new? 
And in that, and maybe the one thing I'll, I'll, I'll maybe take it, you know, there will be sacrifice, yes, but there's also growth. And in that there is opportunity. And how do you let go of the fear of the sacrifices and the losses and really embrace the promise of the opportunity? I think that's the challenge for anyone trying to uh, build a true 21st century organization, because I think the 21st century really began in March of, uh, of this year. Um, thank you, James. Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely the beginning was was a lot of sacrifice, you know, um, money and sleep and you're just trying to make things work and, and keep your organization afloat. Um, specifically for us, I think that one of the, the things that, that I tried to focus on as a leader is when you're running an organization literally on the front lines and, you know, you're not working from home, you're, you're running clinics, you're, you're seeing people, um, you're having a lot of face-to-face -face contact with a lot of people every single day. Uh, th there was definitely a lot of thought put into how, how me and my team were trying to have these conversations incredibly openly and incredibly transparently with, with everyone from you know, your nurse to your operations manager on how do we feel safe? How do we feel comfortable with this? Um, you know, we, we weren't quite, we honestly weren't quite sure the magnitude of, of, of what would what would happen, both, both in terms of how COVID would evolve, but also in terms of how our team would or would not kind of show up every day. And, and the reality is, I think that's what, what I was really impressed with is we had a ton of resiliency within the frontline team. Um, we didn't have anyone want to sit this one out. Um, everyone's been there, everyone's been seeing patients, everyone's been, giving us a, a lot of feedback on changes we can be making and we continue to, to kind of rewrite things every couple of weeks to make sure that people feel safe when they go to work. So I think that was one of our, our, our big challenges. I think that, that coming out of that, you know, we're sort of in, in this place where some of the immediate and urgent and difficult conversations around resources and safety and risk um, have kind of stabilized there is that that silver lining that James has alluded to where you then start to think, my goodness, you know, we took a 30% hit in, in our revenue, we had to cut our budget by 30% as a result. And we actually did a lot of really smart things and forced a lot of tough conversations that we probably could have done or should have done even in the absence of, of a crisis. So, so that is kind of baked into our thinking for next year. How do we work together? How do we allocate our resources? Um, and also similarly, you know, moving your organization to a quasi remote structure, I think forces the, the exact same thing. How do we create accountability without face to face? How do we, how do we use empathy when people are taking care of kids who are home, but still try and be a results driven organization. So, um, yeah, so I think there is a lot of silver lining in, in a lot of the difficult conversations we, we had this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Megan. Yeah, I'll be brief because I think in the scope of sacrifices and challenges that people have faced throughout COVID-19, um, you know, I can't claim any huge personal sacrifice. I think a lot of the entrepreneurs we were supporting, you know, dropped their salaries very quickly by 20%, 50%, 75% to be able to retain their teams and maintain their teams. And we really saw our role as again, coming in with some of this emergency financing to be able to soften that blow um, for their operations, make other introductions and connecting people um, where we thought there were other resources that might be able to help them. We are experiencing organizationally a little bit of what Melissa mentioned in terms of, you know, we fundraise for our own operations and for our own um, investing work as well. And that landscape is shifting in response to COVID. And so we're also taking a hard look at things that um, you know, where we want to double down and do more and things that we may want to do less of or, or do differently, but that's really at, at an organizational level um, more than personal. I think for us as a team, you know, we had the luxury of working remotely. We were, you know, just able to really challenge our energy um, to supporting the companies and the fellows that we work with. Thank you. I'm going to ask our speakers to please take uh, a minute each because we only have five minutes left. So, um, Andy yeah. and, and Samir. Mm -hmm. I'll be very brief. So I think everybody said everything that we kind of have, the journey we've been through, and um, maybe just organizationally, um, I think I'll um, 
reflect on what Samir said actually when he started out um, was that we have to abandon ego and that's both personal ego and organizational ego. I think that's what the one lesson that we've learned um, coming out of this. If we want to really have strong, deep collaboration, we have to abandon that. Um, and I think, yeah, so to sort of exchange com competition for collaboration um, is the one big sacrifice that we, that we, it's not a sacrifice. I mean, it's a necessity, but it feels like a sacrifice and we have to manage the way, the way we perceive um, this new way of thinking. So, yeah, I mean, we're looking forward to interesting times. Um, there was, there's two things, yeah, two things. Things I think we need to go up. one that I didn't think about that. The second thing is, you know, we're moving from a, a complicated world to a complex world. So complicated means that it's a series of patterns that are difficult and there's meandering roads, but there are a series of patterns with outcomes. All of those patterns are now gone. So all of the mental models that we've had for how we used to do things out the window. We need to train ourselves and we need to train our organizations to recreate our mental models and frameworks of how to do things. So the concept of internal good, and we need to now not look at how do we forecast or backcast, but how do we sort of develop the skill of adaptability? So it's sort of really, really sacrificing letting go of all of the old mental models that we had in place to solve problems because we are, we are moving into uncharted territories um, and that requires just new ways of being able Um, thank you, Samir. Um, there's a question from the from the audience who I think the lady asks, how can we use these lessons to challenge the climate crisis? And I think a lot of the lessons that um, the leaders who have just spoken um, apply to not just the COVID pandemic, but to the climate crisis. Um, the lessons that we are learning on adaptability, on creating new value systems, on leading in, in a set of changing values where profit is not always uh, is not your primary driving force so some of those ways that we've had to adapt our thinking are things that will help us to deal with the climate crisis is there anyone else from the panel who'd like to take that question on how we can use this thinking Samir I'm going to just direct that to you how can we use this thinking to to come to yeah. um, meet the climate crisis here yeah. So I think about the climate crisis often because my, my day job is running a, a solar company. Um, and the, one of the weird things that we saw, and this is just a very human thing, is that people were really excited to solve problems during the COVID-19 crisis when numbers were going up. And as soon as numbers started going down, that sense of urgency, that heat started to fizzle out. And... That's really scary because this climate crisis isn't going to necessarily be an overnight pandemic-like emergency. It's gonna be a very long, very slow burden that we're already in, no pun intended there. But it's very long and very complicated and it's very intense. But there's no really one moment where, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are dying in eight months. So one of the challenges that we have is how do we create a sense of urgency when as humans, we have difficult times feeling the sense of urgency. Um, and this is, goes back to one of my previous comments. I think now is the time to get back together and say, what worked, what didn't work? What committees worked? What frameworks worked? How do we put these processes in place today to evaluate what's going to be happening in the future and start solving from now? We can, all of the, all of the, the healthcare, sanitation, uh, economic, all of the challenges we've been working on, they haven't necessarily gone away right now, but they've sort of started to become uh, feeling less urgent. So how do we how do we solve them now? And how do we continue to solve them before another emergency pops up? Um, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have collectively as a group. Thank you, um, thank you, Samri. I'm going to ask Ariel to give our closing remarks. Thank you so much to all the panelists. It's been quite an insightful session. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm glad to have moderated it. Thank you, Wanjiro. 
Wonjiro, thank you so much for, for your moderation and to all the speakers, thank you for your insights. I think we really had a fantastic group of people who, who we had been speaking with probably over the last uh, seven or eight months as we were doing this series. Um, so thanks to all of you for sharing your insights and I really appreciated um, that, that you were really pulling out some of these key themes that we saw over the, the, the 10 series that we did um, for the Crushing the Curve series. Um, and, and that you really touched on all of them, technology, uh, the importance of technology, the importance of, of partnerships um, and how you know, we, we can't do any of this alone. Um, and, and then finally, the, the flexibility um, and flexibility, not just in funding, but in flexibility of, of the way that our world is, is operating right now. Um, so thanks once again to all of you. Um, I did post the, the link to the full report uh, in the chat box. If anybody would like to, to learn more or talk with us, um, please reach out to, to anyone at the IntelliCAP team or anyone at the AVPA team. Nancy, Frank, it's been a pleasure hosting this series with you. Um, and it's our sincere hope you know, that, uh, that the lessons from this are, are scaled and shared more broadly um, within the global south and not just, um, you know, not just within Sankop and not just within our personal network. So please feel free to share uh, the insights far and wide. Thank you all once again, have a fantastic time uh, and enjoy the rest of your Sankop. <laughs>